Okay, we are in James. Pick up where we left off last week. James chapter 4. We're going to start reading now in verse 11. James chapter 4, verse 11. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? So, this is a portion, remember, James is, is the in-your-face apostle. He just comes and he shares it. He says, there's a problem here and I'm going to address it. And he's not addressing this problem just because there is no problem. He's addressing the problem because there is a problem with these Jewish believers who were in the diaspora that were dispersed abroad. And he's writing to them. And he says that there's a problem here of judging. Now this, he says that, that um, when you judge in this way, you speak against the law and judge the law. Now this, this definite article, the, the law, it's not there in the Greek, so it's not speaking about the law of Moses. And in fact, in the New Testament, when they make reference to the law of Moses, they often put the law with a capital L. So it, it's a way of, of, in the English, distinguishing. Uh, but so, since this is not speaking of the law of Moses, it's probably speaking of the law that he introduced earlier in James chapter 2, verse um, verse 8. James chapter 2, verse 8, he says... If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. So, the royal law was something greater. The royal law is loving your neighbor as yourself, which is a portion of the Old Testament law. But Jesus had summarized that, that, uh, that these were the greatest commandments. But he says that we are speaking against loving our neighbor as ourself if we judge our brother. If we judge our brother, we do this. So let's see what, what Jesus had to say about things like this. Turn, turn back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 7. And we'll see what Jesus had talked about, this sort of thing. Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 12. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. So, now Jesus says, he makes reference to the law, the law of Moses. He says, you want this distilled down? You want this concentrated for you? Here's exactly what it is. What it is, is you treat others the way they treat you, loving your neighbor as yourself. Look in Matthew chapter 22, that same book, Matthew chapter 22. Jesus deals with this issue again. Matthew 22, verse um, 36. Matthew 22, 36. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Everything written, he says, that was commanded of you Jews. There were 613 commandments that they had been commanded in the Old Testament. 613, not just 10, but 613. He says, you shall it can all be summarized in this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You know, it's interesting. Jesus made a small change here when he said your mind. In, in the Old Testament, it says with your might or with your strength. Jesus talked about with your mind. That we are to love God with everything that we have. And to love our neighbors as ourselves. And James says that we, when we speak against a brother... We end up really having trouble. 
keep, stay in that same book, turn back to Matthew chapter 7. Jesus again addressed this. Matthew chapter 7, let's read from verse 1. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So look what Jesus said. He says, by our standard of measure, it's going to be measured to us in judgment. Think about that. If somebody does us a wrong, and we want to hold on to that, and not let it go. By that standard of measure, we will receive in return. That's why it says, Father, forgive us, our, forgive us our transgressions as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. Right? The Lord's Prayer. Has anyone here never said the Lord's Prayer? Okay, so I'm assuming that means that everyone here has said the what is called the Lord's Prayer, but really was the prayer that Jesus said we should pray. And it's that, Father, forgive us our transgressions as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. For in the same way that you forgive others, so your heavenly Father will forgive you. That's what the Scriptures say. In the same way that we forgive others, our heavenly Father will forgive us. In the same way. So if I hold on to things, guess what that means? It means that God is go- going to hold on to things. And you say, well, why God would you do that? Why would you hold on to things? Well, because you just prayed in the same way that I forgive others their transgressions, so forgive my transgressions. So God says, okay, I will do that. You asked of me, I will do that. Do you see how dangerous it is to hold on to transgressions? It is terribly dangerous. That means that we are asking God to hold on to our transgressions against Him. And I don't want that. We absolutely have to, as believers, release this. We have to release this. See in verse in, in Matthew chapter 6, read from verse... 12, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, for if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Matthew 6, verse 15, but if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Whoa. This is exactly what the Word of God should do to us. If you have no fear when you read the Scriptures, you've got a problem. You must learn to fear when you read the Scriptures. Because God really means business. There's tremendous blessing here. But there is also tremendous problems that come come into the believer's life if we do not obey them. It says, if you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive your transgressions. And I have heard people even say, I will never forgive that man. Never. And I'm like, yikes. Let me just step away from you because I don't want to get hit by that bolt of lightning when it comes. You don't know what you're saying. You're asking God to not ever, to, to never forgive you for your transgressions if you won't forgive another. And this is a hard thing. I mean, sometimes, let me give you an example. Sometimes people were abused, physically abused as children, sexually abused. Raped, molested. I'm not the one asking you to proclaim forgiveness. I'm not the one. Jesus is. Jesus is the one. The one who upon the cross, after they they had nailed these into his hands and his feet, he looks down at them, after them raising him up on the cross, after having beaten him and spit on him and made fun of him and mocking him, he looks down and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It is him who puts before us the need to forgive others. 
If we hold on to that, we are in deep, deep trouble. We must learn to forgive. Now, with that, it's not just, oh, I'll work this out. God's grace is there. If He's asking us to forgive people who have really hurt us, who have really hurt people that we love, God's grace is there to give us that forgiveness. You see what I mean? It's not that He leaves us alone. His grace is sufficient. If it was up to us, how could we forgive? But it's not up to us alone. God's grace is there. He gives the Holy Spirit for a reason. Jesus said in, verse, in chapter 7 of Matthew, verse 1, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the same way you judge, you will be judged. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. In the same way that I hold on to things, in the same way that I judge others, I will be judged. And this happens in the natural realm too. If I am very quick to judge others, God judges me. So often this has happened to me. I'll be driving and somebody doesn't use their directional signal. And they turn. I'm like, I wish this guy would just use the directional signal. Within five minutes, I'm making a turn and I'm like, I made that turn. I didn't even signal. And God just shows me that I do this myself. You see what I mean? One day I was in the, in, in the gym on campus. And I've been using the same locker for ten years. Right? The same lock for ten years. And this student was walking up. And this was, this was back in the days when um, they would issue you a lock and you could go to the front desk and get the combination. You know, things have changed in the last couple of years. But they would issue you a lock and you would... You would and they had a book with your combination. A girl comes, young lady comes up, and she's asking the attendant. She says, "I forgot my, my combination. Could you tell me my combination?" The guy's looking at the book, and I'm waiting behind her. I'm saying, "You know, this girl's in college. She can't even remember her combination." This is like five-year-olds do this in elementary school. They remember their combination. That same morning, I went to my locker, and I was in my gym clothes. So I had opened my locker to get dressed in my gym clothes and I had worked out and here I am all sweaty and I can't remember my combination. Can you believe it? I can't remember it. And God is just showing me by your standard of measure that you judge others, I will judge you. You, you enjoy hearing this, don't you? Sure, she's beaming. She's beaming. She really loves to hear these sort of stories. <laughs> this happens with Shireen a lot too. So... <laughs> And let me explain, let, 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 let you misunderstand. So, I balance the checkbook. Shireen doesn't. Shireen just tries to fill in what she remembers she did. And so, usually when I go to the checkbook, she knows what she's going to hear after five minutes. Shireen! What was this charge? And, you know, because she'll have forgotten to enter it, or there's a check missing... Uh, check that's been missing, but it wasn't recorded in the little book and things like that. So always what I'm doing, I'm calling her and I'm pointing out her faults. But you know what invariably happens? There's some missing item and it's something that I left out. You know, so Mr. Careful, Mr. Budgeter, Mr. Accountant. But I don't run and tell her, hey, you know, this happened to me too. I just keep quiet about that. <laughs> but this happens in the same way that we judge others. We will be judged. And that's why Jesus said, you know, you see this speck in your brother's eye and you, go to, you want to take it out and you have this beam in your own eye. The problems that we have, we see readily in others. We see readily in others the problems that we ourselves have. And that's why we have to be particularly careful. So, so if, if others have you know, the bad habits that I have, I so readily see it in them. Are you, are you, you're really enjoying it this morning. <laughs> so, I, I readily see it in them. And this is what happens. The problems that we have, and this is why Jesus said, you know, the speck you go to pick out of your brother's eye, you've got the same speck, but much larger. You've got this beam in your own eye. So the picture that Jesus paints for us is that, is that we've got this beam you know, in our eye and extending outward about four feet. 
And we're trying to take these little tweezers and saying, let me take this speck out of your eye for you. This is the picture that he gives us. And this is why James said we really got to be careful against judging others. Let me, because, because I have this tendency to judge, and God really pointed this out in my life lately, I, I wrote down a bunch of verses from the New Testament on this. And let me just read a few of these to you. This is from James 5.9. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. Romans 2.1 says, you who judge, practice the same thing. So remember, when we judge another, there's a good chance we practice the same thing. Romans uh, 17... Uh, Romans... I can't read it exactly. 14.4, 17.4 says... You, who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Romans 14.13 says, Therefore let us not judge one another. You know, so these, all these verses about judging, judging the servant of another. And Jesus even talks more about this. Look in, in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Matthew 5.21, you've heard it said by the ancients, you've, you've heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the supreme court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Oh, I mean, these are pretty strong words. If it wasn't the Son of God speaking, we might be able to have a case against this. But this is God Himself speaking. Look what Jesus does. He again raises the bar on the Old Testament law. He says that... If you commit murder, you're liable to the courts. You should not commit murder. This is what it tells us in the Old Testament. Jesus now equates the penalty of committing the act of murder with calling our brother a fool. He raises the bar. This is what he does. How can he do this? Because he fills us with his Holy Spirit and he gives us grace to walk in his way. This is how he can do this. If we say to our brother, you're a fool, it says that we could be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. I mean, how how does this match up with once saved, always saved? God loves the little children. I don't know. But all I know is we shouldn't go there. Everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. You don't know what my brother did to me. Jesus says you better get past that. You better learn to forgive. He means business here. God wants to deal with our hearts. And then he says in verse 23 of of Matthew 5, Therefore, if you're presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. You know, I, I, um, I was thinking about this sort of thing. And in preparing this, I was reminded of somebody that I needed to go and ask forgiveness of. And I, I sent him uh, an email last night saying, I need to talk with you on the phone. I'll give you a call at 7.30 tomorrow morning. And I called him this morning at 7.30 and it just went to voicemail and I left him a message that I'd like to talk with him. I didn't want to just send him an email and say, sorry, I, I need to talk with him and apologize to him. And I will do that. And I, the message that I left him this morning is, um, I'll call you this afternoon after you get back from church. I said, I, I'll get home by around 11.30 or something and I'll call you. 12.30 or 1 o'clock or this afternoon, I'll give you a call. 
There are things we need to deal with. And if you think that this thing, you, you get past all of this in life, but at some point you don't. There's all of these things. This is why Jesus tells us to do this. Because He doesn't want all this baggage being heaped upon us. He doesn't want us to risk the problem of God storing things up against us. He wants us to be released. This is why he, why he tells us. So what if we see a brother really doing something wrong? What are we supposed to do? Well, Jesus deals with that as well. Matthew chapter 18. So if we see a brother really doing wrong, it's okay to approach them. We don't just have to say, well, you know, I can't judge him. You know. No, the Bible says there, if we see them doing something that is contrary to the ways of God, there is a way of dealing with it. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So there is a way to deal with this. And the way is, if you see a brother sinning, or a sister sinning, you can go to them, and it says go privately and discuss it with them. I have found much better than going to a brother and saying, um, ra rather than saying, hey, you know, you're doing wrong with this, and you need to get this corrected, or even, why are you doing this? You know, why are you doing this wrong? It's much better to say, could you explain to me what's going on here? I want to try to understand from your perspective. And often what we'll find is, after we get their perspective, there's no problem. You see what I mean? We just had a, a partial view of what was going on. You know, say the, the guy's never going to church. And you're going to say, you know, there's a problem here. You need to go to church. And then you go and you talk with the brother and you find out, well, the reason he's not going to church is because his infirmed mother needs his help every Sunday morning. You, you see what I mean? I mean, maybe, maybe there's some basis there rather than to... But once you can assess the situation... And look, I've learned all of this by doing it wrong. Okay? So this is who I am. I've done this wrong so many times. So I'm trying to spare you some of that. So once you deal with that issue, give them some time. Pray for them. Give them some time. And if still they persist in this, then you want to take somebody along. Jesus said, this is what you are supposed to do. You know, one of the easiest things in a Christian walk is to do nothing. That's the easiest thing. Well, that's his business. I, just, I have enough trouble with myself. No, one of the hardest things to do is to get involved in other people's lives. And to talk with them about it. And I, conf I confront people, it would be easier to not confront them at all. It would be easier not to do it and just to back off. But we have a responsibility with our brothers, with our sisters. And you speak into their life. And if they really are continuing in this sin after you've given them some time, after you pray for them, you go back and you bring someone else with you. So that it's confirmed, so that they can see, hey, this is a pretty important thing. There are two believers coming at me and explaining this to me now. And remember, if this happens to us, may we be open. May we be open. You know, people have come to me with things and said things to me, and I'm like, yeah, you know, you're right. You know, I don't want to have to get it to the point where they've got to come with somebody else, and I don't want to have to get it to the point where, the, you know, they call Pastor Landrum, and he calls me up and he says, hey, Jim, I need to talk with you. I mean, that, I'm like, whoa. And... So sometimes even when the pastor calls, I just say, have I done something wrong? You know, I just want to know, you know, what have I done wrong? But he says if he refuses to listen, then you've got to go and you've got to tell it to the church. Now the problem is many believers, when they're doing wrong, they have no accountability to church authority. So there's no avenue to go to the church because already they have no relationship with the church. You see what I mean? So, you, you know, you get pastor, your pastor, which has no pastoral role over them. 
So the best thing you can do is just go with another brother, and that's it. You've got to leave it there. You can't go any further. But if they respect, say, some campus, campus minister, you can go to them as, as some overall authority and, and, and let them deal with the situation. Now, maybe the, the campus minister will say to you, well, look, you don't understand really what's going on in this life. And that's fine. But he lets us, and in fact, he requires of, of us to go and deal with issues in other people's lives. And then he says, if after all this they don't listen, you're to treat them as a Gentile and as a tax collector. Well, how did the Jews, how did Jesus treat Gentiles? He didn't just say, oh, dogs. He didn't. I mean, Jesus was, I mean, he, he dealt with, the, uh, with the, the Roman soldiers. I mean, he said, I have, I've never seen faith like this. He, was, he reached out to them. And as tax collectors, Matthew, who's writing this gospel, is a tax collector. Jesus reached out to him. So in other words, you treat them not as a brother, but you put upon them now the expectations that you would put upon an unbeliever. You see, the expectations upon an unbeliever are different. I can't go to an unbeliever and you know, start expecting of them the things that I would expect of a believer. So if I see you know, a, a, a believer moving in, a, a believing girl moving in with an unbelieving guy, I can go to the believing girl and say, you know, this is wrong what you're doing. But to the unbelieving guy, I mean, this is, this is you know, the M.O. This is what they do. There is not that sort of hook that I can get in them because there's a different issue I've got to deal with that person, and that's sharing the gospel. So you put upon them now the expectations of an unbeliever. That's how you treat them. Because there's no authority now of the Word of God in their lives. This is the way that God is, tells us to deal with these sort of things. It's like this in dealing with employees too. So say you go and you're dealing with some administrator in the university who isn't very good. Have you ever met an administrator that maybe wasn't the best in the world at their job? You need to go back to them and them only before you go directly to their boss. And not that that's an absolute requirement, even by this verse, but it is a good practice based on this verse. And I have found that if I go back, so in other words, if I'm dealing with some administrative office by email, and they mess something up, I need to send another email to that same administrator without copying their boss. But if it persists, then I can go to the next level, to their boss. You see what I mean? They will like you much more. If you have a tendency to right away go over a person's head, they won't like you very much. And so sometimes I'll get them on the phone, I'll say, look, I've dealt with this issue three times. Can we try to get this resolved? And if you can't resolve it, I need to know what your boss's name is because I'll go to the next level. But I don't want to have to do that. And then they usually get the picture. You know, a thing happened recently where, where a guy, I guess, was upset with me or something. We were working on a research project together. So um, he wrote an email to me, and he copied the chairperson of my department. He copied my dean and the dean of engineering. He was like, whoa, <laughs> wow, that was amazing. And so I went to his office and I said, you know, that was quite an email. Now that you've publicly said my faults, can we just sit down and talk about this? You know, and I, and I really reached out to the guy and I, and I think he, was, he really then realized what he had done. He didn't realize the magnitude of, of what he was calling into play here. And then we talked about this and we shook hands and we were friends. And I said to him, I said, you know, I didn't even know that I got you upset. And I am sorry for what I've done. Would you please forgive me? Totally blown away, because the world isn't used to hearing this. You know, I'm sorry for what I've done. Would you please forgive me? And then I, after I got done with him, I said, I want to call your staff in too. So could you call your staff person? Because I may have offended her as well. And she came in. I said, I'm very sorry for what I've done. Would you please forgive me? And she's like, yeah, that's fine. I mean, she didn't even know what was going on. <laughs> so these things will happen. 
it's much easier to deal with the individual employee than to start copying their boss, you know, and their president and all these other things. The person will like you much more. It's just a good, natural practice. Okay, we are going to close in prayer, and then I'm going to have a few announcements. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the Word of God, which speaks truth into our lives. Father, you say, if we have, if someone has ought against us, or there's some problem with a brother, that we are to deal with that. Father, I pray for these young people that they would not have to carry that sort of baggage in their lives of unforgiveness. Father, your word is so vivid that you won't forgive our transgressions if we don't forgive others. Even the others that have so hurt us and hurt the ones we love. Father, I pray for these young people that they would learn to walk in forgiveness. Father, that they would learn to walk in the forgiveness of God. Father, I pray that they would be free. Turn their hearts closer to Jesus. And in your name I pray. Amen.